Hi, my name is Claire Sims and I'm the Admissions and Access Officer at Worcester College in Oxford. Uh, now that means I have a bit of a split role. I spend half of my year talking to young people about what it's like to study at Oxford. I go into schools, I answer queries, I run outreach events. Um, and then the other half of the year I'm involved in the administrative side of the admissions process here in Oxford. So I get a bit of an insight into what the admissions process looks like from the inside um, and how competitive candidates kind of set themselves apart when they're applying to top universities. Today I'm going to be talking in a bit more detail about Oxford University, what it's actually like, how it differs from other universities and why you might consider making an application to study here. Um, all the information I'm going to talk about, all the information you need, is covered in the new University Prospectus. So that's available online on the publications page of our website. You can go and take a look at that and the new University uh, Interviews Guide and Families Guide. Also, if you have any questions which I'm not able to answer, you're more than welcome to get in touch with me directly. My email address is on the bottom of all these slides. So I'm going to start off by talking about why you might consider studying at Oxford, what's so great about the university. Um, and I think one of the main reasons why we get a lot of applications every year is because of the kind of world class education which we provide. So for the fourth year in a row, the Time Tower Education Survey has ranked us as their top university in the world. And that's really exciting. Um, and I think it's a reflection of the amazing teaching and resources which are available to all of our students. For example, we've got over 100 libraries in the city, ranging from little college libraries to big departmental libraries with hundreds of books. Um, on the right there, you can just see the top of the Radcliffe camera. That's one of our big university libraries. We've got over 13 million items in our printed collection. Um, and somebody takes out a book from one of our libraries roughly every 21 seconds. So pretty much anything you need for your course, you can find in our libraries. Uh, a lot of students can get through their degree without even having to buy a textbook, uh, because pretty much everything you need for your course is on your doorstep. If you're a scientist, you'll be excited by the fact that we've got over 1,500 labs in the city. Um, so you can use the same labs and the same materials which have been used in Nobel Prize winning projects, right? You can get involved in world leading research. Uh, you can work with top academics in the scientific field to really get hands on experience in your subject um, and get kind of the top education and the top resources available to you there. We've also got five world class museums, historic gardens and collections. So if you walk down the street from Worcester where we work, you'll find the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, it's the oldest public museum in the world. It's got loads of really exciting and interesting galleries full of ancient art, modern art, that kind of thing. Uh, if you walk a few steps down the road, you'll also find the Natural History Museum, the Pitt Rivers Museum, the History of Science Museum and the Oxford Botanical Gardens. All of these collections are really fun places to work, fun places to socialise, so you can hang out with your friends there, show your family there when they come to visit. Um, but they're also really interesting places to kind of develop your educational perspective as well. So you can go there, you can get involved directly with the artefacts and materials which make up your course, um, and you can engage with your subject on a really deep and interesting level. That high ranking is also a reflection of the quality of teaching you can find in Oxford. Our teaching is widely considered to be some of the best in the world. Uh, so like most universities, we offer lectures, classes and seminars for students to learn key course content together. Your lectures might take place at your department and they'll probably cover big topics for everyone doing your subject or module. Uh, if you take classes and seminars, they're usually relatively small and they give students the opportunity to contribute and discuss topics in closer detail. For example, if you're an English student, uh, you might have a class once a week with other people doing English at your college and you might read a text or look at an article to prepare beforehand. If you're taking a science subject like biology or earth sciences, your degree will probably also involve some lab work and or some field trips. With all of our labs, our esteemed researchers and our field work opportunities all over the world, there are loads of opportunities to build up the valuable practical experience you need for a scientific field. Now, no matter which subject you're doing at Oxford, it will involve quite an amount of independent study. Um, and that depends on which subject you're taking. So if you're doing a humanities subject, your contact time, so the amount of time you actually spend opposite a tutor or a teacher talking about your course, um, that'll probably add up to about five to 10 hours a week. So the rest of the time that you're working, you'll probably be studying independently in a library across the city. If you're a sciences student, you'll have a bit more direct course content. So you might have somewhere between 15 to 20 contact hours a week. Um, but even then, you're still looking at about 20 hours or so of independent study. Um, so that's something that's consistent across all of our courses. It might seem intimidating to begin with, um, but as we'll see in a moment, a lot of our students can manage their workload and still find plenty of time to pursue their own skills and hobby outside of their work. Perhaps the most unique element of teaching at Oxford is the tutorial system, which you might have heard of if you're familiar with supervisions at Cambridge. It's a pretty unique uh, part of our system. And um, what a tutorial basically is, is it's an hour or an hour and a half where you're sat opposite a world leading academic in your topic and you get to throw a few ideas around. You get to discuss some work which you've already prepared um, and you get to talk about where you might go next in your studies um, and get some really detailed feedback on the work that you've already been doing. You normally have tutorials with one or two other people who are doing your subject. It's rarely more than that. Um, and it gives you a really uh, intense and unique way of really learning from world leading academics um, and picking up on their experience and kind of throwing ideas at them. Um, and it gives you a really quick um, and developed perspective of your subject really quickly. 
As Aditi says here, uh, the tutorial system is incredible and unmatched by any other form of education delivery. It's one of the most famous and popular elements of our teaching Oxford. Now, as you can tell from the tutorial system, studying at Oxford gives you the opportunity to really dig deep into your subject, which is why subject choice is one of the most important decisions you can make when you're looking at applying to university. Um, in fact, passion for your subject is one of the most important things that we look at in our admissions criteria. Um, so here's a selection of some of the courses that you can do at Oxford. We've got around 250 to choose from. Up here, you'll probably recognise a few of these subjects, so things like chemistry, English, history, um, you'll recognise those from school. You can study some of those subjects together, so you might do history and French, you might do computer and philosophy as a joint school. Uh, you can even do some subjects in threes, so you can do philosophy, politics and economics. You can do psychology, philosophy and linguistics. You can't pick and choose from everything, so you can't do a joint course in, for example, history and maths. Um, but we do select certain courses which you can do as kind of joint schools because we think they complement each other and they work well together as a kind of joint degree. So you'll probably recognise some of those courses already, but there will also be a few things up there which you might not recognise, which you haven't come across before. Um, and it's really worth having a look at those courses and see whether they might suit you, whether you'd suit them um, with the kind of A-levels and current experience that you already have. For example, you might have spotted Earth Sciences, uh, which is the study of the planet, and it draws from a wide pool of, so of sciences. So it draws from chemistry, physics, biology, all the typical stuff, but it also includes parts of geology, geography and paleontology. Or, for example, if you're a humanities student, you could study classics, which is a wide ranging humanities degree. Uh, it looks mainly at ancient Greece and Rome, and it takes into account literature, history, philosophy, languages and archaeology. So when you're looking at university courses, don't just think about the subjects that you're already taking, but also think more broadly about why you enjoy those courses um, and what else you could do with the skills that you've developed, um, which would suit you just as well. Some courses are more oversubscribed than others. So here we have a list of some of our most popular courses on the left and some of our courses with lower application rates on the right. So this is a slightly cynical way of thinking about your subject. If you've decided that studying medicine or law at university is the perfect course for you, then obviously high application rates shouldn't put you off. However, you might have chosen a popular degree subject which appears on the left here without considering the full variety of other courses which might suit you just as well. A budding lawyer might have a look around at the other courses on offer and find a course which they are equally as qualified for but which they hadn't previously heard of, like for example theology and religion. The exact same A-levels which you would need to meet your offer for a physics degree at Oxford could also get you an offer for earth sciences or material sciences on the right. We offer plenty of courses which don't require any specific A-level subjects. For example, you'd only need three A's at A-level without taking any particular subjects to study philosophy and theology, archaeology and anthropology, ancient and modern history, theology and religion, or classics here. So when you're thinking about picking your university course, it's worth bearing a few different things in mind. Uh, you might start off by thinking about your favourite A-level subject. What are you really enjoying doing right now? Would you like to carry on with it for the next three or four years? Would you like to combine it with something else, maybe something you're already doing or something which is totally new? Or would you like to pick a totally new subject altogether, um, something which might build on your A-levels, use the skills which you've developed thus far, but which is a brand new subject in which you haven't actually studied before? Um, before you pick your university course, have a look at all the options available. So have a look through the prospectus, see if there's anything which really jumps out at you which you haven't discovered before. Think about whether you'd like to study abroad. Um, it's worth noting that at Oxford, you can't really study abroad unless you're doing a course which involves a language. So, for example, if you're doing German, you can spend your third year abroad in Germany. Um, if you are interested in that as an option and you want to take a year abroad, no matter which subject you're looking at, um, have a look at other universities as well and see what they're offering um, to see whether you can study abroad for maybe a term or a year as part of your course there. Have a look at the research projects available. We're really lucky at Oxford to have tons of world leading research going on right now. Um, we've got academics who are leaders in their field and they're leading groundbreaking projects all across the university. Undergraduates often have the opportunity to observe these projects, even get involved occasionally, maybe in their third and fourth year. Um, so it's worth having a look at all the things we've got on, seeing if there's anything that interests you, anything in particular you'd like to get involved in. Have a think about the way the course is assessed. So the kind of fine art degree you'll find at Oxford um, it's very different to the kind of art degree you might find at other top universities, for example. So have a look at how the course is actually managed. How is it taught? Are you mainly assessed through exams, assessed through coursework? Um, have a think about whether that will suit you and what kind of course will make you most comfortable over the next few years. Have a think about future career opportunities, um, but don't worry if you're not exactly sure which career you'd like to have yet. Um, the good thing about having a degree from a top university is it will set you up with the kind of good skills that most employers look for without pinning you down to a certain career at this stage. Uh, so you can take the skills which you earn from an Oxford degree and apply it to a wide range of really interesting jobs after you graduate. 
It's also really worth bearing in mind whether you meet the entrance requirements and the selection criteria. So you do need to meet the required grades for your subject um, and you need to be the right kind of person for your course um, in order to make a successful application. Oxford definitely isn't all about work. Studying here is about working hard, but it's also about making the most of your time as a student and enjoying what you love. Um, it definitely doesn't mean that you're chained to a desk in a library for three or four years and never allowed out to have fun. Our students engage in hundreds of extracurriculars at uni, and if they can't find a club or society they love, they can often apply for funding from the university or from their college to set up their perfect student community. We've got over 70 sports clubs offering everything from a casual kickabout once a week in the university parks to teams of a near professional standard which compete against other universities. You can get involved in music, drama, literature and the performing arts in a wide variety of theatre spaces in the city, from 50 seat studios to 650 seat professional theatres. Some of Oxford's most notable alumni include famous performing artists like Hugh Grant, Emma Watson and Gemma Chan. As a student, you can volunteer across Oxford, write for the student newspaper, join a debate team, or get involved in weekly events with a faith or community group. There are definitely loads of activities you can get involved in when you're not studying. Some people might assume that studying at Oxford is like being stuck in a medieval castle for three years and not having access to any 21st century facilities. On the contrary, Oxford is a thriving city. It has the oldest English speaking university in the world, but it's also one of the youngest cities in the UK and a quarter of the population is made up of students. This makes it a really diverse and enjoyable place to live as there are plenty of things for you to get involved in as a young person. We've got a brand new shopping centre called the Westgate, a wide selection of independent shops and cafes. Uh, we've got a historic array of pubs and bars, restaurants, theatres, gardens and pretty much everything you need to enjoy your time living here. Um, it's a really modern city with plenty to offer its student population. Now we mentioned earlier that Oxford students are busy but they can find time to fit in their studies and their social life. Well here's what your average timetable might look like if you're a history student with us. As you can see this person has quite a busy schedule. Their studying time is coloured in in purple and blue, blue for their contact hours, purple for their independent study and all the rest of their time, the yellow and green boxes, is their social life. What you'll notice about the student's timetable is that their work is spread pretty evenly throughout the week. They've got a few lectures, a tutorial and a class in the week, but they're always spending at least a couple of hours each day doing their own reading. This is pretty typical for one of our humanities students. They have fewer contact hours than your average scientist, so they can be a bit more flexible with their working hours and keep up with their reading outside of a nine to five working schedule. Outside of their studies, they have lots of time to catch up with their friends, take part in student societies and keep up with Netflix. You might be surprised at how much social time this person actually has. We've highlighted their academic time here, which shows you the amount of work they're doing each day and the relatively low number of contact hours. Um, but all those empty gaps are free time where they can do whatever they want. This person gets to pick and choose when they do most of their work because their degree is predominantly geared towards independent study. So when they want to take a Wednesday afternoon off after handing in their essay or have a lion on a Monday morning, they can make it work within their schedule. We can compare that history student schedule to your average schedule for a physics student. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, scientists are likely to have more contact hours in their timetable because there's more direct course content for them to learn, which they couldn't pick up as easily from independent study. In this student's timetable, you can see they've got a lot of blue contact hours on Monday to Friday, particularly lectures in the morning and labs in the afternoon. Um, and they've also got a couple of tutorials. Most students have one or two tutorials every week. Compared to the history student, they have a little bit less independent study time. They're still working on lab sheets and reports to make sure they're consolidating their knowledge and preparing for upcoming tutorials, but they're completing a relatively higher proportion of their work in guided contact time. Their weekend is mostly free. They're only doing a couple of hours of preparation for the upcoming week on Sunday afternoon. If we look more closely at the student's contact time, you can see that their week is slightly more structured than the student taking the humanities degree. By studying for around 40 hours every week, your average student is working for roughly the same amount of time as somebody working in a nine to five Monday to Friday job, which still leaves them time to have a social life. This student tends to be up early on most weekdays to get to their morning lectures, but they can still look forward to a lion and a packed social schedule on Saturday. One of the most common misconceptions about Oxford is that the work is really hard and that nobody will be there to support you if you find you're struggling to cope. In fact, the university provides extensive resources to make sure that every student can access the support they need to successfully complete their degree. Here we're looking at two tiers of support. The special support you can get through the college system on the top row and the wider support which is offered by the university as a whole on the bottom row. Oxford is a collegiate university. Now we'll be talking about that in a bit more detail in a minute, but what it essentially means is that our undergraduate students are divided between 35 mini campuses across the city where they often live, eat, work and socialise. Being part of the college system means you're part of a small academic community where it's easy to get to know everyone. The smallest college, Corpus Christi, has an annual intake of about 70 students, while the biggest, St Catharines, has an annual intake of about 150. There are also permanent private halls like Regent's Park which are even smaller. 
This means we can take a really personal approach to welfare here, where the welfare staff at each college can get to know students as individuals. All colleges have peer supporters, uh, which are students who are trained by the counselling service to listen to other students. You can also talk to your personal tutor about any worries you might be facing. They're in charge of your academic commitments, so you can go to them if you're struggling with work or finding it hard to maintain a good work-life balance. A lot of colleges now employ a professional welfare officer to coordinate the college's health, counselling and disability services at a college level and make sure students are getting the support they need for their studies. Colleges also employ nurses who are usually on site a few times a week for drop-in appointments with students. As well as being a member of a college at Oxford, you're also a member of the university as a whole, and that entitles you to support from intercollegiate support services. For example, you can go to the university's free counselling service and receive welfare support from trained professionals. We have a really well-resourced disability advisory service, which around a quarter of our students use, which helps students to set up special arrangements like adjustments for their exams and study support throughout the term. The university offers a phone service which runs from 8pm to 8am during term time in case students need to chat to somebody overnight and the student union offers a casual advice service where students can drop in or send in any practical questions they're not sure about. Welfare support at Oxford is bespoke and provided on a student by student basis, whether a student just needs to chat to somebody or they need consistent and specialised support throughout their degree. We are particularly proud of our extensive careers service. With their help, Oxford graduates go on to a fantastic range of jobs around the world. Right now in the UK, your average starting salary when you graduate from university is about £21,000 a year. When you graduate from Oxford, your average starting salary jumps up to about £25,000 a year. And within a year of graduating, around a quarter of our former students are earning over £30,000 a year. Throughout your degree, you can attend regular careers fairs, chat to visiting recruiters, apply for lucrative internships, and arrange one-to-one -one appointments with careers advisors to help you build up a professional portfolio before you graduate. Not only that, but the career service is there to support you throughout your life. If you wake up in 30 years time and decide to pursue a totally different careers path, you can still call up the career service and get all the same in-depth advice and guidance about your field that you would have got as a student. Here's a quick look at what recent Oxford and Cambridge graduates studied before pursuing law as a career. That big red section is made up of undergraduate law students, but they're not the only students who went on to become lawyers. In fact, we can also see that large numbers of historians, classicists and English students became lawyers as well. There are 15 subjects represented here and they're not all humanities or essay writing subjects. You also get plenty of natural scientists, economists and geographers graduating from Oxbridge and going on to successful careers in the law. There's a widely circulated myth that in order to become a successful lawyer after university, you have to have taken an undergraduate law degree. That's not true. As we can see from this graph, only around half of our graduates who go into the law actually studied law at undergraduate level. You could take a totally different degree and then pursue a conversion course after you graduate to qualify to practice law. Now let's take a look at what you might go on to do with a biology degree from Oxford. Here's what some of our previous biology graduates have ended up doing. You might have predicted some of these jobs, things like ecologists, physiologists, biologists, technologists, that all sounds very sciencey. However, there are also a few jobs here which you might not have predicted. We've got a musician, an editor, an accountant, a teacher, a doctor, even a nature holiday guide. These graduates all took vital skills from their degrees at Oxford, but they didn't necessarily need to go into a field of biology to find a job they loved. Studying any degree at a top university like Oxford will provide you with key employable skills which are highly sought after in a world of careers. The question I get asked the most about Oxford is what makes a really good candidate? What kind of person do you need to be to make a successful application to a top university like Oxford? Well, I can start off by telling you what we're not looking for. You don't have to be an absolute genius, a perfect A-grade student since the moment you were born, or a really posh person to make a great application to Oxford. Instead, we're looking for students who are motivated, academically able, and genuinely interested in their chosen degree subject. We've already talked about that genuine subject interest, and it's one of the most important things about Oxford, which we really can't emphasise enough. The application process is all about expressing your interest in your subject. We're also looking for students who have academic ability and potential. This means you have to meet or be predicted to meet the entrance requirements for your course, but it doesn't mean you must have achieved straight A stars throughout your entire academic career. Prior qualifications like your GCSEs make up a relatively small part of our assessment process, and we focus more on your current performance and your potential performance over the next three or four years as you undertake your degree. If you didn't perform as well as you'd hoped at GCSE, but you've really hit your stride at A-level, that doesn't mean you'd make a weak application. We look at every grade and context, and we focus on your academic potential. All of our students are hardworking and self-motivated as well. As we know, there's a lot of independent study in an Oxford degree, so you have to be prepared to work hard and learn how to manage your own time. 
What I love about this quote at the bottom here is that Isan says, everybody is a geek in some way or another, but most people are completely unintimidating and you can have a completely relaxed conversation with them. You don't have to come from any particular background to make a successful application to Oxford University. We care more about why you're passionate about your subject and why you'd make a good fit for the courses here. One of the other questions I get asked quite a lot by applicants is how much does it actually cost to get a degree from a top university like Oxford? Does it cost more than it would to go for another Russell Group University, for example? Um, the answer is no. In fact, it can actually be cheaper to go to Oxford because of our collegiate system and because of the amount of financial support we give out to our undergraduates. Before we talk about that, it's worth having a quick review of what your average university student's costs actually look like. As a student, you have two main expenses, your tuition fees, so the money you give to your university to pay for your teaching, your textbooks and resources, and your living costs, so the money you spend on food, accommodation and social activities. Right now, tuition fees in England are capped at £9,250 a year, which means that no university can charge you more than that for a year's tuition. Most universities will charge you this amount. Your living costs will vary depending on your lifestyle, but most students spend around £9,000 to £14,000 every year. Most students take out a student loan from the student loans company to cover their tuition fees. You don't ever see that £9,250 a year. It doesn't come into your bank account and then go out again. The student loans company pays it directly to your university at the start of each academic year. At the end of your degree, you then repay your student loan over a 30 year period. You only start repaying your student loan when you're earning over around £25,000 a year. If you graduate and get a job where you earn £21,000 a year, you won't have to start paying back your student loan until you've crossed that earning threshold. Once you do start paying back your student loan, it's automatically deducted from your salary like a tax. And it's taken as 9% of what you're earning over the income threshold, so it's not 9% of your whole salary. We'll take a closer look at what that means in practice in the next slide. If you haven't paid off your student loans within 30 years of finishing your degree, the loan is wiped, so it won't follow you around forever. It's kind of more like a graduate tax. Now to cover your living costs, you can get a maintenance grant from the government, which is payback on the same terms. It's automatically taken out of your salary once you're earning over £25,000 a year and will be wiped off after 30 years. Rather than going directly to your university, this money will be put into your bank account in increments at the start of each academic term. The amount of money you get is determined by your household income, which your family provides to the government when you apply for student funding. Depending on your level of household income, you can receive between around £4,000 and £9,000 from the government to help pay your living costs at university. On top of this government support, you can also get bursaries and scholarships from your university. This is what your student loan repayments might look like, depending on which job you take after graduating from university. As you mentioned earlier, if you're earning around £21,000 per year, you don't hit that threshold for repaying your student funding and you won't have to pay anything back. If you're working in a job where you occasionally earn more than the monthly threshold, you sometimes have to pay back your student loan on the months where you are above the threshold, but in other months when you aren't, you won't have to pay back that student loan. So let's say you graduate and you start working on a graduate scheme where you're earning around £27,000 a year. Now that you're consistently earning over the income threshold, you'll have to pay back your student loan every month, but you'll only be paying back about £9.60 every month. That's roughly the same as a Netflix subscription or three and a half takeaway coffees from a high street chain. By comparison, you're taking home around £1,800 in your pocket every month after paying your taxes, so your student loan will make up a relatively small proportion of your income. Now let's say you get a job as a junior aerospace engineer and your salary jumps up to £32,000 a year. The proportion of your salary which you pay back to the student loans company will remain the same. You'll still be paying back 9% of however much money you earn over the monthly threshold. However, the actual amount of money you pay back will increase with your growth in salary to around £45 a month. That sounds like a pretty big leap, but your take home income has also gone up to £2,200 after tax and it roughly equates to the amount you'd normally pay for an all inclusive gym membership or a new iPhone contract. I mentioned that your level of financial support can vary according to the university you go to, as you can get different bursaries and scholarships. Oxford is really generous and it gives out over £8 million every year in financial support to its students. These aren't loans, it's not money that we expect back, it's just additional support which we give out to our students based on their household income to make sure they can live and study comfortably at the university. At Oxford, you're part of a college. This can help to keep your costs down, as your meals and accommodation are often heavily subsidised and your college can give you extra grants for travel, books and hardship. Plus, no matter which college you go to, our terms are only eight weeks long, meaning you can often save money on your accommodation contracts. The university has enough resources to make sure you rarely have to buy materials for your course like textbooks. And there's a big pot of centralised funding which all of our students are eligible for. When the student loans company assesses your household income, you can choose to share that information with your university. Oxford then uses that information about its students to determine how much extra financial support they'll need to meet their living costs. Students from the lowest household income bracket are eligible for the university's Crankstart scholarship. 
This is our flagship financial support scheme. It gives you up to £5,000 every year, as well as access to funding internships and volunteering opportunities to help you make the most of your degree. Students who have a slightly higher household income, up to £42,875 a year, are eligible for the Oxford bursary. That's a means-tested bursary, so they have a look at how much your household income is and give you the right amount based on that. It's between £3,200 every year and £500 every year to help top up your living expenses. In addition to these bursaries, which are given to you automatically based on your household income, you can also apply to, for a wide variety of scholarships. Some of these are listed on the right here. The final thing to talk about when we're talking about Oxford is the college system. As I mentioned earlier, a college is a small academic community where you can live, eat, work and socialise as a student here. You're a student at Oxford in three different ways. You're part of the university, you're a member of your department and you're a member of your college too. Oxford University encompasses the whole student body, so it oversees all the different colleges and departments and it gives you your degree at the end of your course. Your department will organise a lot of your teaching and coordinate your course on a subject level. You might go to your department for lectures, labs and occasionally tutorials. Your college is often where you spend the most time though because it will usually provide you with accommodation for at least part of your course. It will provide you with social spaces like common rooms and dining halls and it will probably be one of your most immediate sources of community within the university. Every college offers accommodation, pictured here in the top left, a dining hall, pictured bottom left, a common room, pictured top right, and a library, pictured bottom right. These pictures are all from St Catherine's College. Now, as you can tell, not all colleges look like Hogwarts. St Catherine's was built in the 1960s and it doesn't have that typical medieval architecture, big chapel or gothic gargoyles, which you might associate with some of our more traditional colleges. All the colleges look a little bit different and they have something different to offer. They can vary in size, location and facilities. Some have pets, some have music rooms, some have special societies and so on, but they all provide the basic facilities you need to live and study at the university. What Izzy says here about how you fall in love with a college even if you don't apply there is absolutely true. The college system is a quirk of universities like Oxford and Cambridge, but choosing a college definitely isn't the most important decision you'll make when you're thinking about university. It's far more important to think carefully about your course and to make sure the university as a whole is right for you. There are a few things we get asked about all the time when we're talking about the collegiate system. First of all, everybody wonders whether some colleges are more competitive than others. This isn't true. Admissions is a university wide process. And if any college has loads of applications, applicants get moved around between colleges to make sure that everybody gets fair consideration. All the colleges sign up for a common framework of admissions, which means that the application process for your course will be the same across all the different colleges. Colleges don't have specialist subjects. They provide a really high standard of teaching for all the courses they offer. Most colleges offer most courses, uh, which is great because it means you get to socialise with people studying a wide range of different subjects around you, rather than just socialising with people doing your subject. Some of our smaller courses are only offered at certain colleges, so for example you'll only find human sciences at seven of our colleges, but for most courses you have a wide variety of colleges to choose from. Big subjects like English, history and medicine will be offered at pretty much every college. For a full list, check out the university website. Finally, if you're thinking about applying to Oxford or Cambridge and you want to specify a preference for a college, my advice is to check out a big one, a small one, an old one and a new one to see which style of college suits you best. As we mentioned, the admissions process is the same across colleges, so picking a college is more to do with specifying the kind of atmosphere and facilities you'd like rather than making an academic choice. You can read all about the colleges online, take a look at each college's page in the prospectus, visit us on an open day or check out different colleges on social media to find out more. So there you have it. Um, that is our standard introduction to Oxford. Uh, there's a lot more to discover and if there's anything here which you weren't sure about or you'd like to look into in a bit more detail, um, please do check out the online prospectus or send me a quick email if you have to chat. I hope you found this information helpful uh, and I hope it will encourage you to think a little differently about Oxford when you're considering your choices for university in the future.